What's cracking? Big. Yo, folks. Welcome, bike, to the channel. Welcome, bike, to the headquarters. My name is Nicholas. This is BDGE. And I'm starting to think what kind of weekly series is Siri do I want to do going forward for the summer? You know, during the off season, during the spring months, we're focused very heavily on rookie and dynasty drafts. So I had my Don't Say the Cars Topless Tuesday weekly series where we were exposing one rookie going too high, too low in rookie drafts. I'm like, eh, we're, we're shifting our attention to season-long leagues. And I'm like, what's the best way that I could start to break apart the ADP and be helpful and useful to y'all? And I started thinking, this sophomore class, man, this sophomore class is unlike any class we've seen come in in a long time from every position. The running back and the wide receiver group were some of the deepest. They were in there. We went fist deep in this class, and they're going to be impacting fantasy football for a long, long time. So I'm going to be doing each Tuesday. This is going to be a weekly thing. I'm going to be going down the, the ADP, the average draft position per underdog. I will link that down below, free to use, free to find. And I'm going to be going... One player at the running back position, one player at the wide receiver position, and we're going in depth on them, okay? So, for instance, we're starting today off with the RB1 and the wide receiver 1 per ADP, and we're just going to break them down. We're going to hit you with the big facts. We're going to slap you straight in your face hole with them. The good, the bad, where they're going in drafts, if I think they're a value, what their 2021 fantasy outlook looks like right now, and then y'all can decide what you want to do with it, all right? So, today, we're going the RB1, the wide receiver 1. Next week will be the RB2 and the wide receiver 2, and so on, and henceforth, until drafts hit us. And by that time, we'll probably be like 12 deep and you won't really need to know the other guys in the sophomore class. So this is going to be a sophomore series. I haven't really thought of a name. So if you've got any clever, witty names, something funny that we should run with, drop it in the comment section while you're down there. Don't ever, 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 ever forget to hit the thumbs up button. Let's YouTube know that you like the videos. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. We'll be doing this again weekly, but we'll be putting out videos every single week. Mock drafts yesterday. Other shits tomorrow. I don't know what I'm doing tomorrow yet. They're going to be there. And y'all are here with me. And I love you for that. But y'all know the rules. So the first thing we got to do before we kick it off is tuck our shirts in. Stop yelling. Let's eat. So the class was juicy. At the running back position, man, we got... The Cam Akers, the Clyde Edwards Hilaires, the first running back off the board in the NFL draft, DeAndre Swifts, J.K. Dobbins, Antonio Gibson. It goes on and on and on. Actually, it stops literally right there for relevant players. One guy I didn't name, the clear RB1 out of the sophomore class this year, is the Indianapolis Colts' Jonathan Taylor. His ADP right now, per underdog fantasy, is the RB6, 6.5 overall. Sometimes he's the sixth pick, sometimes he's the seventh pick, but he lands flat in the middle of first round drafts. This is non super flex ADP, okay? So you throw a couple super flex spots in there, he's probably going middle end of the first round. So he is a clear high end RB1 this year in fantasy. He had a truly, truly schizophrenic season as a rookie. Like Skip Bayless's takes would be looking at this shit like, wow, that was schizophrenic. It was horrible to begin the year. He had the Trent Richardson comparisons coming at him. It was like the first 10 weeks of the season, he gave us nothing. And remember, going into the year, this is while Marlon Mack was healthy. People were drafting him in the third round. Sometimes you'd get lucky, he'd fall to the fourth round. But that's where you had to draft this man because the hype of him coming out of Wisconsin was so high based on his prospect profile, which was pretty much flawless at that, at that point. All that being said, with the schizophrenia included, he finished the year as the RB4 in standard, the RB6 in both half PPR and full PPR. Now, we have to take into consideration for this year, and it's the reason why I am getting bike onto the draft running backs early and often in fantasy football this year, hype train, because they're coming off such a bad year last year. The top end guys, the Christian McCaffreys, the Saquons, everybody either got hurt or busted last year. So everyone's going to be a little bit down on the running back group, okay? So we're going to be looking at other wide receivers to be taking at the back end of the first round, the early second round, whatever. I'm here to say, hit it bike to bike with the running bikes. Again, we're back on that strategy, and Jonathan Taylor falls straight, straight into that slot of guys you should be hitting early. His numbers, his raw numbers last year were impressive, okay? RB4 in standard, RB6 in the other leagues. Comes with the caveat that most of the top running backs were hurt. The final stat line, 232 carries, 1,169 rushing yards, 11 rushing touchdowns, 5 yards per carry. In the receiving game, 39 targets, caught 36 of them, 299 yards, 
and a tugger. Okay. Here's what I mean by that. Like, like this was, this was an impressive rookie season, obviously, but when you're looking at the raw stats and you're like, holy shit, he finished this high in all these categories, take it with the grain of salt. Okay. Third in the NFL in rushing yards. Okay. Jonathan Taylor finished third in the NFL in rushing yards, 1169. There was only one other year over the last 20 years, other than 2015. This was the only year that that total 1,169 rushing yards would have been good for the third most rushing yards in the NFL. So again, a very down year for running back statistically. Still a good year by Taylor, but let's not get it. Let's not get it twisted. Let's not get it crazy. And 2015 was that year where all the top running backs died like it did this year, right? It was like Marshawn Lynch just off the top of my head. Jamal Charles, like all these guys got hurt or they started withering away. And we had this new stock of running back coming in. All those guys got hurt. And uh, this is very similar to that year. That was the last time that that number would have been top three in the NFL. He also did this thing behind an elite offensive line. This was the third best run blocking line per PFF. No surprise, right? Quentin Nelson anchoring the group and the rest of them are starting to get better and better and better. Third best run blocking line per PFF. Also, his run blocking efficiency per player profile at number four. So you look across multiple platforms, all the ones that are doing deep dives into analytics, great offensive line. And that is what we're looking forward to. That's why we like Taylor so much. That's why we liked him coming in. And that's why we continue to like him going forward. If Marlon Mack didn't leave in week one with the torn Achilles, there's really no telling if Taylor would have actually finished as like a top 24, even top 30 fantasy running back. If we're going to be honest here, because Marlon Mack came out the gate fucking hot, then he got hurt and Taylor didn't do shit for the first 10 weeks of the season. You throw Marlon Mack into that equation and who knows, who knows what we get from Jonathan Taylor, but Mack goes down and even then we're seeing like a full split at the running back position in Indy between Taylor, Naeem Hines, Jordan Wilkins. Uh, uh, the season hit a low point for Taylor in week 10 where he saw just seven carries for 12 yards. Seven carries, 12 yards. And that was a week after he saw six carries in a game. So you're thinking, oh, fuck. I remember people were like, Taylor is droppable in a redraft. I never went that far, but like you had to have had concerns, obviously, if you drafted Taylor in the third week or whatever, or in the third round, excuse me. Then something changed. And from week 11 through the wild card game for the Colts, Taylor went nuts, okay? He played 43.5% of the snaps from weeks 1 through 10. This is how we're going to break it down, all right? Weeks 1 through 10, and then weeks 11 through the rest of the season. He went from a 43.5% snap guy, sharing the backfield completely, to a 62% snap player. Still a notable number because that's not really that high, okay? 62% of snaps, not that high of a number. What's more important is his opportunities. Went from 16 opportunities a game up to 23 opportunities per game. He had a 20 carry, 150 yard, two touchdown game against Las Vegas in the first round of the fantasy playoffs. And then the pointless week 17 game, as y'all probably actually don't remember if you're in fantasy football. Week 17, he went for 30 carries, 253 yards and two touchdowns in a game. He took over as the guy, as we expected that we saw in Wisconsin down the stretch. But there were a few caveats to be made, right? These videos are all going to be laying out the big facts. I'm not going to be like, I love this guy or I hate this guy. I'm just going to give you the pros. I'm going to give you the cons, the green, the red, and y'all can figure it out yourself. His schedule over the second half of the year when he went off was fucking abysmal. Abysmal. Tony, zoom in. Get my mouth. Abysmal. Green Bay. Houston. Las Vegas, Houston, Pittsburgh, Jacksonville, Buffalo. Hit me again, Tube Sock. Let's go. Green Bay, Houston, Las Vegas, Houston, Pitts, Jacksonville, Buffalo. Every one of those teams outside of Pittsburgh, miserable run defenses last year. And Pittsburgh held Taylor to the lowest total rushing of all those teams, of course. So did Jonathan Taylor actually get better as the season went on? I mean, probably or was it the David Montgomery effect, right? Injury to the backfield and then plus the fucking Charmin soft schedule. There is a, a little bit of a red flag concern to a guy like Jonathan Taylor. Going into this year, the other big change in the picture is, is Carson Wentz. Carson Wentz obviously comes in is going to be the starting quarterback. They traded for him from the Eagles. Phil Rivers, however, is one of the NFL's premier, premier screen game quarterbacks and always has been. 25% of his throws last year went to the running back position. Fourth highest rate in the NFL. The year before that, 32% of Phillip Rivers' throws went to the running backs. Easily the highest rate in the NFL. The year before that, 27%, third highest rate in the NFL, and on 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 and on. The screen thing is a Rivers thing, right? The screen thing is a Rivers thing, not the offensive scheme thing. Hines, Naeem Hines was sixth in the NFL last year 
with 18 screen targets. Jonathan Taylor had 11. Even Jordan Wilkins, who had 15 targets overall, six of them, 40% of his targets came on screen plays. So you have to ask yourself, with Rivers gone, how impactful can Jonathan Taylor actually be in the passing game? And how impactful overall will his passing game be to running backs? Man, that's another red flag here because if they're not doing a, a lot of screens, like a lot of big plays from Jonathan Taylor, a lot of big plays from Naeem Hines came in the screen game, right? Manufactured screen plays are the most efficient and the most useful for running backs in fantasy football. Do we not have a lot of them? Uh, we're not going to have as many as them without Philip Rivers here. You have Marlon Mack coming bike, right? With Rivers out of the picture, we start to piece together everything we start to piece together how many touches is Naeem Hines going to get how many touches is Jonathan Taylor going to get is Marlon Mack going to be impactful the way I'm looking at it is if we if we get anything close to Carson Wentz from a couple of years ago this offense is going to be good enough that that Taylor doesn't really need to catch more than 35 passes to be a top five fantasy running back right the offensive line is awesome. Again, number three in run blocking per PFF, number four per player profile. So they're going to give him this efficiency, this 5.0 yards per carry, just off the fact that the offensive line is awesome. He gives you that home run ability on any given carry, right? And now he's going to get the goal line carries. Now he's going to get the goal line opportunities. I know it felt last year like Naeem Hines was consistently taking those bullshit carries by the goal line. And you're like, why is Naeem Hines when they have a guy who looks like he ate Naeem Hines sitting on the bench in Jonathan Taylor? Last year, Jonathan Taylor finished with 16 goal line carries, okay? That was the seventh highest rate in the NFL, seventh highest overall number in the NFL. And that was while he missed a game, okay? So don't 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 let the don't let the fucking couple of red zone carries or don't let the uh those clips from like week one and two in the beginning of the season skew you from the fact that Jonathan Taylor had a shitload of goal line carries. If the Colts are a good offense, there's no reason that Jonathan Taylor shouldn't crack 20 goal line carries in 2021. So when should be a lot better this year, just based on the fact that the pass blocking alone should be a lot better for him this year. He's gonna get a fresh start in Indianapolis. Uh, the biggest question is, will Marlon Mack impact Jonathan Taylor? Colts re-sign Marlon Mack to a one-year, $2 million contract. Torn Achilles is brutal. Uh, it, it zaps explosiveness from the running backs. We've seen recent athletes come come bike from it full strength and, and be fine, even, even really good after it. But like the contract doesn't say that they're too, too excited about Marlon Mack. And you look at the tweet from Daniel Khalil. Marlon Mack's objective lacked options on the open market to become a featured running back. Objective grade three. Achilles tear assessment, high chance of compensation injury in 2021. Plan Hines on third down, ta Taylor Premier Talent. He's an easy fade comes 2021. Yeah, I mean, obviously, Marlon Mack's not the guy that you're trying to draft this year, but in terms of an impact, I really, really doubt Marlon Mack's going to be anything more than a breather back. So if you're taking Taylor, the argument has nothing to do with him being an 85% snap guy. I think we know that. Naeem Hines is going to be used, and he's going to be used on third downs. There's going to be drives where it's a Naeem Hines drive. The thing is, Taylor's going to have drives where he gets in for a single play because he is the only play on that drive and he's going to rip off a 60 yard touchdown run that's what you're drafting a guy like Jonathan Taylor for okay he doesn't need to be a 50 catch guy you know one of the videos I made last summer and I'll update it and remake it this year league winning running backs right are guys that average 20 fantasy points per game in a single season most of those guys catch a lot of passes but the ones that don't the ones that don't if you're drafting a guy like Jonathan Taylor you're drafting him to be Derrick Henry last year you're drafting him to be Derrick Henry in 2019 or Ezekiel Elliott from 2017 or Ezekiel Elliott from 2016 right where their team scoring, the team offense is very good, typically top 10. Run blocking rank, top six, right? You could see all the years of Henry and Zeke when they did not catch balls. Henry had 19 receptions last year. He had 18 the year before. Zeke in 2017 had 26 receptions. In 2016, he had 32. And I would argue Taylor probably will have more than all four of those single seasons right there. If you're drafting Taylor, you're drafting him because the run blocking line is awesome. So you don't necessarily need him to catch a ton of passes. The offense will score. The run blocking will be good enough that his efficiency will be super fucking high. Question just becomes, can can Carson Wentz lead them to be a top 10 scoring offense this year? They were eighth last year. Most people don't know this, but the Indianapolis Colts under Phillip Rivers were eighth in the league in scoring last year, 27.9 points per game. And I think they can be a top 10 scoring offense this year. I think it will be on the back of Jonathan Taylor. Jonathan Taylor is the guy, and I'm very much okay with drafting Jonathan Taylor in the first round and being my high-end elite RB1 for fantasy in 2021. I know there's a lot of chatter now going around. I feel like it's the popular opinion to say Taylor's getting drafted too high. And maybe six overall is a little bit too high. Maybe that's not where I'd love to draft him. But listen, if he's your RB1, I don't think you should have any concerns. So Jonathan Taylor is the RB1 in this sophomore class going seventh overall. The wide receiver one in this sophomore class is the wide receiver six overall. And that is Justin Jefferson, ADP of 24th overall. So he's getting picked at the 212. Going off the board, back end of the second round. Pretty much the greatest single rookie wide receiver season ever. 125 targets, 88 catches, 1,400. Say it with me. 1,400. Doot.
Doo -doo. Seven touchdowns. So we see an easy changing of the guards last year from Adam Thielen to Justin Jefferson. Thielen stayed fantasy relevant only because he was scoring touchdowns, man. Um, but Jefferson became the focal point of that passing offense halfway through the season, and they did not look bike, and they will continue to move forward as Justin Jefferson is their alpha in the passing game. Adam Thielen, fantastic compliment, but he's not the one anymore. They didn't add any real pass, cap, uh, pass catching competition to, to the funnel there, so the target funnel is going to continue to be Jefferson, Thielen, Dalvin Cook, that's it. Irv Smith will obviously get mixed in a little bit. Gary Kubiak steps away and retires. His son is stepping in as the offensive coordinator, Clint Kubiak. And you look at the reports, uh, he is expected to keep the offense exactly the same, which means 85% of the targets, again, are going to to their normal playmakers, right? Nothing added to the equation. When we start to look at analyzing the players for the upcoming year, we have to look at all the things that are changing from year to year, right? That's why Taylor's write-up takes a long time because you have to look at Marlon Mack coming back. You've got to look at what he did down the stretch. You've got to look at Carson Wentz coming in. You got to look at the new head coach or offensive coordinator, or whatever, losing him. A lot of different dynamics to look at. With Justin Jefferson, almost nothing, 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 nothing changes, okay? Over the first eight weeks of the season, Justin Jefferson saw five and a half targets per game which was nearly two below what Adam Thielen was seeing during that stretch. Over the last half of the year, Justin Jefferson's target number shot up from 5.5 to 10.1 targets per game. That was four above Adam Thielen. So I expect that to be the case in 2021. And he just excels all over the field, man. When you look at Matt Harmon's reception perception chart for Justin Jefferson, look at the coverage type, man zone, press, double coverage, didn't matter. His percentile in terms of success rate versus them, versus man, versus zone, versus press, 91st percentile versus man, 96th percentile versus press. When you look at it, man, Justin Jefferson is just a, a young Keenan Allen for years to come. No question about it. If I'm fading Jefferson at the back of the second round, if I'm fading him at the 212-3-1, it is strictly because I want a running back there. It is strictly a roster construction strategy type draft pick. It is not because I'm expecting a different performance. I'm not going to look at the fucking analytics and say he's due for regression. None of that fucking coward peasant bullshit. If you're fading Justin Jefferson, it is strictly because you'd rather take a running back there, which will happen most of the time for me in my drafts, but Jefferson at the two. 12 fantastic draft pick wide receiver one yes this is a run first offense and that is okay to draft wide receivers in run first offenses that have target funnel passing games and this is that it's justin jefferson it's adam thielen and it is the running back dalvin cook those are the guys who get the targets which means your fantasy wide receiver one is the one getting the target here you got jonathan taylor you got justin jefferson as the rb1 and the wide receiver one in this absolutely loaded loaded sophomore class so we'll be bike tomorrow for a different fantasy video but next week to cover this class rb2 and wide receiver two i believe is cam Akers and cd lamb off the top of my head so we'll break them down in depth if you enjoyed the video let me know what you're doing with these two guys is taylor getting drafted too high for you is justin jefferson going too low for you are you fading either of them if so why drop the big facts down below hit the thumbs up button if you enjoyed subscribe to the channel if you are new and i'll see y'all tomorrow. Peace.